Thank you, Brother Gene. Any, any of you that have ever spoken for God know that we always need prayer before we speak because these aren't just simple matters that we're talking about. You talk about divine things, you need divine help. <clears throat> I have um, some copies that I've made of my message. Uh, I know some of you like to have copies of that. I don't have them out in the back yet. They're in the trunk of my car right now. But later on today, if you'd like a copy of this, it'll be available. But uh, some of the things I'm going to say won't be in there. Um, those that speak at the renewal, if you, you, you always know that if you're going to speak towards the end, you just keep adding to your sermon as the three days goes by. So there's a few things I'm going to say that you, you won't find in what I leave for you back there. After looking at some of the other sermon titles, it looks like, it, it might look like that I'm the fly in the ointment. <clears throat> um, Brother Bill had somewhat, had to approach somewhat of a negative part of this last night, giving us warnings about if we pass over the love of God. Well, I'm going to tell you today that God's love is conditional. And so that, at the outset, that might appear to be bad news, but we're going to see that it's really not. It's good news for those that God loves, and it's a great incentive for those who he does not love, that do not love him. <clears throat> so I want to say here at the outset that you might hear some things today that you've never heard before. Um, I'm not going to teach what is popularly taught, so I want to exhort you to have tender hearts, to have ears that are able to hear, eyes that are able to perceive and receive the things that come from the scriptures. I, I don't have a special revelation that Christ gave me. I'm just going to tell you what the Bible says. That's all I'm going to do. Don't be afraid of what I'm saying here. I'm just going to tell you what Jesus said. Nevertheless, nevertheless I do want to tell you, uh, give you this exhortation, because I'm not going to, I'm not going to say things that are uh, going along with what is popularly taught today. But it is the truth. That is that God's love is conditional. This is one of those things that's so plainly declared in the scripture, it kind of amazes me that people have been able to pervert it and garble it up. And it amazes me more that people receive it by droves. <clears throat> so I have to approach this subject from somewhat of a defensive point of uh, view because of these other teachings that exist out there. I, I'm forced to address that to some extent. This isn't anything new or unique to our generation, but we're faced with a lot of vain traditions in the churches. Vain church tradition, vain traditions of men. And these are all things, brethren, you know this, those of you that are close to Christ, you know you're gonna have to overcome all these things to receive what God has for you. You can't hold on to vain traditions of men and the hoary old church traditions and receive what God has too. You, you've got to be able to let all that stuff go. It doesn't matter who it came from. And I'm not saying everything in church history is bad. Don't get me wrong. I'm saying you've got to approach any, any type of subject dealing with the God. You've, you've got to take it from him and him alone. You've got to be willing to lay everything else aside. We're faced with all kinds of vain traditions today. And I'm talking about having a love of the truth. That's what I'm talking about. That's what we need to have. We've got to rise above all the cliches like the Great Commission. That's right, I said that. We've got to get above the Great Commission. We've got to get above all the cliches like God hates the sin but loves the sinner. We've got to get above the stuff people that say God's love is unconditional. We've got to get above small groups and mega churches. We've got to get above the 40 days of purpose and praise and worship. You've got to be able to leave all that stuff behind and be able to simply ask, what did Jesus say? Amen. That's what I'm here to tell you today. I don't, I, compared to what Jesus has to say, and speaking comparatively, I couldn't care less what anyone else has to say. Amen. <clears throat> and that's the attitude that we've got to have. And if, and if you're not able to do that, I'll just tell you now, you're not going to be able to receive what I have to tell you today because I'm going to tell you what Jesus said. <clears throat> Now, I'm not saying that, that other people's words and, and writings, we've got a lot of people in here that have taught in colleges, or, that have written extensively. I'm not saying that all that's bad. What I'm, what I'm saying is that uh, anything that we hear or read stands or falls 
according to what's in the Word of God. That's all I'm saying here. <clears throat> now the basis for my sermon is taking, taken from the book of John, and I've uh, really been edified by this thought throughout this week that a lot of our texts have come from this Apostle John, this Apostle that Jesus loved in particular. We had a lot of scripture texts from 1 John. Uh, mine are taken from the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verse 21. Jesus says here, He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him, and will manifest myself to him. What a wonderful promise. The next one down to verse 23, Jesus again says, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. The last, I have three verses for my main text. The next one is uh, John chapter 16, verse 27. Again, Jesus speaking says, For the Father himself loveth you, because you have loved me, and have believed that I came out from God. Now, as you can see, Jesus very plainly declared here who the, who the Father loves. There's nothing, there's no mystery here in what he said. So the question that's going to arise is, does this exclude others? When Jesus says that this is who the Father loves, is he speaking to the exclusion of other people? <clears throat> that's the questions, those are the questions I want to answer in my message here. Notice also in these texts that in all three of these verses, Jesus talks about mutual love. You know, a lot of people talk about God's unconditional love, but here Jesus talks about a love between God and man. It's a, it's a two-way, it's a mutual love. So maybe we should be asking people about that. When they say, I believe that there is a God, maybe we should just ask them, do you love Jesus? Maybe we should ask, do you have Christ's commandments? When people talk about God's unconditional love, maybe we should ask them, has Christ manifest himself to you? Or have the Father and the Son come and made their abode with you? These are the things Jesus talked about when he talked about God's love. It's a mutual love. This, is, this isn't just a one-way street. No man knows the Father except the Son and to those to whom he will reveal him. So when Jesus tells us about God's love, I'm going to believe what he says, not what men say about it. And I believe that Jesus is telling us here that God's love is conditional. Now, if, if, if it's true, if it is true that God's love is unconditional, surely we'll see that in the Scriptures. It's, if it's true that God loves sinners, if that's true, I would certainly expect news like that to come from Jesus. <clears throat> so let's see if we can find it. What do we know about God that we don't find in his word? After all, God's, God's love is not the kind of thing that can be hidden. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up into glory. And he's speaking to us now from heaven through his beloved son. So God's love isn't something that can be hidden. If, if God loves sinners unconditionally, and if God loves the whole world, I would expect Jesus to tell us this. <clears throat> He's the divine spokesman. Yes. Amen. Let's just take a, I want to look at a few verses in the scriptures here. John 3.36, this is John the Baptist speaking. He says, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Mm -hmm. Not love, wrath. Now, you might say, well, God can be angry and have wrath and still love a person. We'll see here. John 15, verses 9 and 10. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. That sure sounds like a condition to me. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love. John 17, 9, this is Jesus' very uh, open and tender prayer here, a lengthy prayer. 
that he spoke to the Father. John 17, verse 9, I pray for them, I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. Now, if Jesus has an unconditional love for sinners, I would think he would at least pray for them. He, there's a division here. There's a, there's a split. I pray for them. I pray not for the world. Same chapter, John 17, verses 25 and 26. O righteous Father, the world hath not known thee, but I have known thee, and these have known that thou hast sent me, and I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it, that the love wherewith thou, wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. Now, I, you should know by now, I couldn't find anywhere in the Scriptures where it says that, that uh, Jesus loves sinners, or that Jesus loves the world, or that God loves sinners, or that God loves the world. But uh, let's look at some of the apostolic writings, too. <clears throat> Romans 5, 5. Now, hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts Amen. by the Holy Spirit, who was given to us. That sounds like a restriction to me. Does, does the Holy Spirit indwell the entire human race? That's how the love of God's poured out. Romans 8, 39, Nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. 1 Corinthians 16, 22, If anyone does not love the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be accursed. 2 Corinthians 9, 7, Every man according as he hath purposed in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. Amen. Sounds like a stipulation to me. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. What a wonderful trio. I'm not going to split them up. They're traveling together. I... The love of Christ, the communion of the Holy Spirit, and the love of God, the grace of Christ, excuse me, the love of God, communion of the Holy Spirit. He, Ephesians 5, 29, For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord loves the world. No, even as the Lord, the church. 1 Timothy 1, 14, And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. 2 Timothy 1.13, Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. Hebrews 12.6, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Jude 21, Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Now, why would Jude say something like that? If God loves everyone unconditionally, why would he make such a silly statement as keep yourselves in the love of God? Mm -hmm. You've got to think about that. Mm -hmm. Here's our words of Christ in Revelation chapter 3. His word to one of the churches, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous therefore and repent. Mm -hmm. and here there, there's a lot of opportunities in the scriptures such as these for God to say, I love everyone. There's opportunity for God to say, my love is unconditional for the entire human race. There's plenty of opportunity for God to say, I love sinners, and he never said it. And I'm not going to say it either. Now you may be thinking, wait a minute, wait a minute, Brother Mike, you forgot the most famous verse in the whole Bible. Judge not that, e no wait, not that one. Um, John, John 3.16, that's it. <clears throat> That's it. For God so loved the world. What about that? Well, he doesn't say he loves the world. He says he loved the world. And I, I do have to bring this up. Sorry, Brother Jason. That, this is Brother Jason's text for this evening. I'm going to quickly just go over this. It's past tense, and I, I'm going to deal with this later with some other text. But the, the International Standard Version really renders this the way it ought to read. It says, for this is how God loved the world. That's the thought that the Holy Spirit is conveying in John 3.16. It's not that he loved the world so much he just, he just had to give his son. No. He, God's demonstrating something. This is how God loved the world. And did you know 1 John, 
4.9 says precisely the same thing as John 3.16. 1 John 4, 9, In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent His only begotten Son to the world that we might live through Him. Same thing as John 3, 16. This teaching that says that God loves every single person unconditionally has caused men to be sloppy in their perceptions of God, yes. and it's caused them to be sloppy in their views of sin. Yes. It's caused people to not have an urgency about their own sin or about salvation or about the end of the world or judgment. Mm -hmm. And worse than all of that, it leaves men, unregenerated men, with the thought that Jesus isn't really all that important. This is, this is, this is a big deal, brethren. Amen. We're not, we're not going to say what God didn't say, and we're not going to affirm what God didn't affirm. Amen. You've probably heard it said that God's love is so strong it even reaches down to people in hell. People who say this represent the love of God as being completely indiscriminate and unconditional. They say that his love for mankind is so strong that even though he's obliged to condemn unrepentant sinners, his love for them who have rejected his son and rejected his gospel continues on even after they've been judged by Christ, condemned by Christ, and consigned to hell for eternity. Now, brethren, the author of that teaching is Satan. Amen. If Amen. God loves people in hell, they wouldn't be in hell. Amen. What kind of a love would that be? Is that, is that the love that Christ demonstrated? Help me out a little bit here, Brother Jonathan. What's, what is the Greek word for, duh? <laughs> When someone says that God loves people who he has condemned, they're, they're saying much more than just that. They're, it's more, much deeper than what we see on the surface. What they're really saying is that God's love is really just warm feelings he has for people. That's all. That's all it is, is just warm feelings. They're saying that God's love does not mean that he does anything for the objects of his love. They're saying that God is unrighteous. They're saying that God loves sinful, rebellious, and unrepentant men more than he loves his only begotten son. They're saying that Jesus Christ doesn't really fit into the picture all that much. This is a blasphemous teaching. When God loves a person, <clears throat> it doesn't just mean he has warm feelings or strong emotions for them. And if that's all that God lo God's love were... You think about this. If, if God's love is just that he feels kindly toward you, I wouldn't really care if he loved me. Right? If, if God's love is just that he has feelings for you, what would it matter if we were separated from his love? It would make no difference at all. But that's not the love that Jesus taught us about. Amen. That's not divine love. God's love works. Amen. His divine love brings an abundance of benefits to loved ones. His love means he's giving of himself to the objects of his love. He helps those he loves. He chastens and teaches those he loves. God sanctifies those he loves. The Father and the Son have made their abode with the ones he loves. God reveals himself to the ones he loves. He saves those whom he loves. All of these divine benefits are conditional and that condition is in Jesus Christ. Because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath appointed, ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men in that he hath raised him from the dead. God will have no pity, no mercy, no grace, and certainly no love for those whom Jesus Christ condemns. That's why call it hell. <clears throat> the false teaching of annihilationism comes from this distorted view. Annihilationists believe that man's soul is not eternal and that those who are condemned will be tormented for a while, but they'll eventually just kind of burn up and cease to exist in any form, kind of like a chunk of wood that burns, and after a while there's just a little pile of ashes left. So this teaching comes from this, this belief of unconditional love and God loving people in hell and that kind of thing. You see, it just leaves Christ out of the picture. 
We're not going to do that. We're not going to leave Jesus out of the picture. Amen. He's the one that demonstrated God's love. Amen. <clears throat> they believe that because God's love is unconditional, but that is not true. That's not... See, God is love. Yes, God is love, but, but that's not intended to be a complete description of the Godhead or his divinity. That's, that's not all God is. <clears throat> God does have the capacity to hate, and he hates some people. David said, Thou hatest all workers of iniquity, and the Lord abhors the bloodthirsty and deceitful man. As a man after God's own heart said this, by the way. Mm -hmm. The Lord trieth the righteous, but the wicked, and him that loveth violence, his soul hateth. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't think that God even has the capacity to hate anything or anyone. But, but he does. It's declared here in the scriptures. Can you receive it? Yes. <clears throat> These six things doth the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that be swift and running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among brethren. How about this word from Amos? Here God's speaking this to the churches right now, today. I hate, I despise your feast days and your solemn assemblies. I do not savor your sacred assemblies. Though you offer me burnt offerings and your grain offerings, I will not accept them, nor will I regard your fat and peace offerings. Take away from me the noise of your songs, for I will not hear the melody of your stringed instruments. How about this word from Zechariah? Let none of you imagine evil in your hearts against his neighbor and love no false oath, for these are all things that I hate saith the Lord. <clears throat> we have this word from Christ <clears throat> in Revelation 2, 6, but this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Mm -hmm. Amen. So I want to show you here, God does hate. He certainly does. <clears throat> He's more than just love. But God has hatred and long-suffering. He has wrath and mercy. He is righteous and holy, yet he descended in Christ to save men. He's known for his righteous judgments, yet he is the Redeemer and the Savior. The Lord killeth and maketh alive. He bringeth down to the grave and bringeth up. The Lord maketh poor and maketh rich. He bringeth low and lifteth up. He raiseth up the poor out of the dust and lifteth up the beggar from the dunghill to set them among princes and to make them inherit the throne of glory. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's and he has set the world upon them. <clears throat> now Jesus and the apostles didn't put a lot of emphasis on God's hate and that, for obvious reasons, that's not the message of the gospel. The message of the gospel is that God has provided a refuge from his wrath and from his hatred and from condemnation. <clears throat> The good news is that God has provided a means whereby he can shower men with the wonders of his tender, abundant, and divine love. Amen. But his love comes through his appointed means, and that means is Jesus Christ. God's love is conditional. Sooner or later, those who remain outside of the refuge found in Jesus Christ will experience the untempered wrath, hatred, and righteous judgment of God. So now we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you, be ye reconciled to God. Yeah. Amen. God commends, in the present tense, God commends his love to the whole human race. He's saying, look to Jesus. Hear Jesus. Believe on Jesus. And you will have the love of the Father. <clears throat> See, this isn't just about our view of God. This isn't just about my view versus someone else's view. This is about Jesus Christ. That's what God's love is about. That's what we're talking about here. <clears throat> well, I searched the scriptures looking for statements about God's love. <clears throat> and I found a lot of statements in the Old Testament scriptures about God's love for Israel. <clears throat> 
And this caught my attention because this, was, this is kind of a blanket statement. <clears throat> Several times God makes these blanket statements. I, he loved Israel. That's a lot of people. We know Israel's history. Uh, they were no gems at times. But he declares, makes this blanket statement about his love for Israel. I want to read some of these. <clears throat> Deuteronomy 7, 8. But because the Lord loved you, this is Moses talking to the people, because he would keep the oath which he hath sworn unto your fathers, hath the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you out of the house of bondmen from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Mm -hmm. The queen of Sheba, after she had her visit with Solomon there, she said this to him, Blessed be the Lord thy God, which delighteth in thee to set thee on the throne of Israel, because the Lord loved Israel forever. Therefore made he thee king to do judgment and justice. <clears throat> Jeremiah 32, 2 through 4, Thus saith the Lord, the people which were left of the sword found grace in the wilderness. That sword is, that's the Levite sword, not the Egyptian sword. It's when the Moses said, everyone who's on the Lord's side, come over here, okay? Pull your swords and go slay your friends, your brother, and your neighbors. <clears throat> Those that were left of the sword found grace in the wilderness, even Israel, when I went to cause him to rest. The Lord hath appeared of old unto me, saying, Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn thee. Again, I will build thee, and thou shalt be built, O virgin of Israel. <clears throat> Deuteronomy 10, 14 15, Behold, the heaven and the heaven of heavens is the Lord's, thy God, the earth also, and all that is therein. Only the Lord had a delight in thy fathers to love them, and he chose their seed after them, even you above all people, as it is this day. One more in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 37, And because he loved thy fathers... Therefore he chose their seed after them and brought thee out in his sight with his mighty power out of Egypt. Now there are several things I saw in this. First of all, God does not love without a purpose. See, God's not just indiscriminately dumping out bucket loads of love on the human race. That, that does not serve his purpose. This is, a, this is one of the things that people in the churches need to know today, that God's he's doing something. He's got a purpose. This isn't all about just you and me and the fact that we need to be saved. It's much grander than that. Yes. God's doing something. And so when he loves, he's got, he's got a motivation. There's a purpose be, behind his love. Mm -hmm. And you can see that in these texts. The motivation was the fathers. Mm -hmm. That's why it, the people, of, it's not because the people of Israel were such fine folks. It was because of the fathers that God loved them, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. <clears throat> Amen. The second thing I saw here that I thoroughly enjoyed was that this God's love appears to be mediated. <clears throat> but Isaiah 41, 8 says, But thou, Israel, art my servant Jacob, whom I have chosen, the seed of Abraham, my friend. Mm -hmm. That's why I loved Israel, is because of Abraham, mm -hmm. because of his covenant with Abraham. But unto Abraham and his seed were the promises made. But he saith not seeds as of many, but as of one, thy seed, which is Christ. Amen. That's why God loves you. It's not because you're such fine folks. It's his love is coming through his mediator. He loves you because of Jesus Christ. Just like he loved Israel because of Abraham. It's not unconditional. <clears throat> we can talk about the word or the, the love of God. I can stand here and try to give you illustrations or tell you stories and use words to tell the love of God, but the way that God has to tell us about his love is he's got to show it. He's got to demonstrate it. And that's what he's doing in his purpose. This text in Ephesians where God talks about his intent that unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God as he hath purposed according to his purpose which is in Christ Jesus. So God's, he's got a, he's doing something. He's displaying something. The only way you can know about God's rich mercy or his abundant grace or his great wisdom or his abundant love, he's got to show it to you. 
I don't have the words to tell it to you. No one else does either. This, and this is his purpose. He's revealing himself to the entire universe, to the, not only the principalities and powers in heavenly places, but to us. And when whatever other personalities may be out there, God's displaying something. He's wanting to be known. And that's the backdrop of his love. His, his love's, it, all of this, his mercy, his, his love, his grace, these things are being mediated to men. He doesn't just give it to us. It's being mediated, and it's coming through his divinely appointed mediator, Jesus Christ, Amen. our great high priest. God's love is conditional. I thought about whether or not God loves sinners. <clears throat> I looked, you know, I, you might be thinking, well, Brother Mike, just come out and say it. Say either God loves sinners or come out and say God hates sinners. Say one or the other. Well, the scriptures don't say one or the other. They don't. I, you can go ahead and look. They don't say one way or other. <clears throat> and I come to the conclusion because that's the wrong question. That's not even the right question. Whether or not God loves sinners. If, if a person's living in sin, the wrath of God abides upon them. They're condemned already because they've rejected Jesus Christ. Whether or not God loves them is completely pointless. It's pointless. They need to hear Jesus Christ, and then they will experience the love of God. <clears throat> See, it, it, this draws our attention away from Jesus Christ. God has, God's pointing us to Jesus Christ, his divine spokesman. When people teach unconditional love, it steers us away from Jesus. We don't need him if God's love is unconditional. Right? Amen. Yes. Amen. He that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him. We have no guarantee, no promise, no reassurance of God's love in the present tense outside of Jesus Christ. Amen. God's forgiveness is conditional. His promises are conditional. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit is conditional. Grace is conditional. Heaven is conditional. His blessings are conditional. Answers to prayers are conditional. What in the world makes people think God's love is unconditional? It's the same God. If God loves everyone unconditionally, surely such wonderful news as this would be declared in the scriptures, and yet it is not. God's love was once so marvelously demonstrated in the giving of his Son, how could divine love like this be hidden? How could it not be seen and declared? How could it not be obvious? And yet we cannot find where God declares any love for sinners except in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. If that singular, indescribably profound love of God which is in Christ Jesus is not received and on the individual basis how can men be so brazenly presumptuous as to think that God has some other kind of love for them? God's love for the human race is held out in the present tense. It's held out in Jesus Christ. Amen. You reject Christ, you reject God's love. Amen. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. But God commends his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That is when, and only when, God's love for the human race was unconditional. When we were alienated, when we were sinners, when we were enemies, in that condition, God loved us first. He loved us by giving his only begotten son. So if you want more of his love, it's found in Jesus Christ. Amen. We certainly have good news to tell the nations, but that good news is not smile, God loves you. That's not it. It's Jesus Christ. Amen. Now we look in the scriptures, we find many times this word loved. We find the word love in the past tense a lot of times, loved. <clears throat> and this is a very important issue in the understanding of this subject. Loved. <clears throat> Now, it's, I'm, it's not that God used to love and now he doesn't love anymore. That's not the idea that the Holy Spirit is conveying to us. In this, in this past tense use of the word love, loved, the Holy Spirit's pointing us to Christ. He's telling us to look back. You can look back in history at a specific pinpoint in time, a pinpoint in place 
a pinpoint and a person and say, there's God's love. There's where he commended it. There's the demonstration. Now I'm starting to comprehend the great love of God. That's why the Holy Spirit says loved in the past tense. God's telling us to look to his son because his love is defined in the person of his son. It's expressed in the person of his son. His love is found in him and dispensed in him. God is well pleased with his beloved son. The father loveth the son. Let's look at some of these texts. John 13, chapter 1. I'm sorry, 13, verse 1. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own, which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. John 13, 34. A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. John 17, 23. In them and thou in me, that they may be perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Romans 8, 37, Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Galatians 2, 20, In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Ephesians 2, 4, But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us. Ephesians 5, 2, Walk in love as Christ also, also hath loved us, and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. Ephesians 5, 25, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. 2 Thessalonians 2, 16, Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us, and given us an everlasting consolation and good hope through grace. 1 John 4, 10, Here in his love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us <clears throat> and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. 1 John 4, 19, We love him because he first loved us. Revelation 1, 5, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Revelation 3, 9, behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. Now, in, in every one of these, the Holy Spirit could just as well have used the present tense. And, and it would have worked, and it would have been true. He could have said love, or loves, or loveth, or loving, but he doesn't. He says loved. Because God wants you looking back at Jesus. Amen. He wants you looking back at the cross. And when you want to, if you're going to think about God's love, if you're going to spound God's love, if you're going to understand God's love, if you're going to receive God's love, it's in Christ. Amen. It is definitely conditional. <clears throat> this is important to see. Amen. To say that God loves everyone. In the present tense, whether they believe in his only begotten Son or not, is a failure to see what he's doing through Jesus Christ. Amen. To say that God loves sinners unconditionally is to suggest that the Son really is not all that important in the grand scheme of things. Right. The Holy Spirit speaks plainly to us about the love of being in Christ. And a lot of these texts, here's a couple more, Romans 8.35, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? The love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Ephesians 2, 4, For his great love wherewith he loved us, even we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. John 14, 21, He that loveth me shall be loved of my Father. If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him. Amen. For the Father himself loveth you, because you have loved me. See, it's, it's, it's always pointing us to Christ. Right. <laughs> Every single time. The gospel is chock full of good news, brother, and there's no reason why we have to lie to people. Amen. There's plenty of good news in there. Amen. There was only one time that God displayed the depth of his love to his human race, and that's why God, loves, God speaks of his love in the past tense in the scriptures, to point us to Jesus Christ. Amen. If we want to know about God's love and enjoy it, 
we want to know the glory of his love and the benefits of his love, if we inquire into the definition of God's love, every road sign that the Holy Spirit put in place points us to Jesus Christ. That's where God's love was given to the whole world. <clears throat> Amen. Again, back to my text a little bit here. <clears throat> what does Jesus say, or what does he mean when he says, He that, that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And if a man love me, he will keep my words. These are some of the conditions cited in my main text. And first of all, I just want to say he means exactly what he says. I'm not going to try to explain it away. <clears throat> One of the distinctions of the Christian is obedience to this Christ. Amen. Obedience is the fruit of the new man, which is created like God in true righteousness and holiness. Walking in newness of life involves obeying God and serving in the newness of the Spirit. And if we walk in the Spirit, we will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. The new creation is not disobedient to God. Amen. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar. I just love the way John states these things. Just point blank. He's a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby we know that we are in him. This is what Jesus is talking about when he says, He that hath my commandments and keeping them. He talks about having and keeping. <clears throat> now the wonderful news is that the new man, this new creation that God has given us, has his commandments. The new man has his commandments. It's built into the new nature. Yeah. Remember they shall, uh, that the new man is created like God in true righteousness and holiness. And it's written in the prophets, and they shall be all taught of God. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts, and will be their God, and they shall be my people. So when a person is born again, when the old man is put off, and, and God makes a new creation out of us, we have his commandments. Isn't that wonderful? Okay. There, it's not a work that you do. God, God gives you his commandments. They're built into the new creation that he gives. You, you get that by believing that Jesus came out from God. Amen. Believing in Jesus Christ. If you've been born, born again, you have his commandments and you also have the love of Christ and of his Father. Now in the matter of keeping, Brother Gibbon mentioned this last night, that keeping in the scriptures does not always necessarily mean strictly obedience, although that's involved in it. To keep also means to protect or to guard. This, this word keep is the exact same word that's in John 17, 11. Here again, in Jesus' prayer, praying for uh, his beloved, he says, keep through thy name the, those whom thou hast given me. It's the same type of keeping. It's keep them safe, protect them. And that's what Jesus is telling us, but keeping his commandments. He's saying, keep the new man alive. Yeah. Live after the new creation. Don't live after the flesh. Amen. Feed upon the word of God. Keep it alive. Keep his commandments. Mm -hmm. And if you keep his commandments, of course, then, then he will love you. God will love you. They'll come and make their abode in you. Christ will manifest himself to you be because he can. Because you're living Amen. in the new creation. So we should be questioning a lot of the teaching that goes on in the churches today. There's, I see a great stress being put on obedience. And I know there's a lot of disobedience in the churches, and that's, that's why preachers feel they have to stress obedience. But if obedience has to be stressed so much among, amongst professed Christians, this leads me to believe that there has not been rebirth, that there has not been regeneration among the people because the new creation is created like God in true righteousness and holiness. So what they need is to hear and to believe the gospel. Amen. Now, while insensitive and carnal people presume upon the love of God, people with sensitive hearts are going to be looking at this. They're going to examine themselves honestly and they're going to find that we're not able to, to obey his commandments perfectly like we would like to. 
Now, Jesus did not leave thus such tender hearts without his reassurance, without reassurance of his love. John writes, My little children, these things I write unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Amen. Let's not forget that Jesus made payment for our sins. Amen. And we know that this is not a license to sin. I would not suggest such a thing. And we know this, by the way, John stated, if any man sin. But I want to examine another assurance that Jesus has given us. He says, and this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. And he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him. That's in Christ. And he, Christ, in him. And hereby we know that he abideth in us by the Spirit which he hath given us. Now here's another assurance that God's given you believers. There's times that Satan will, will cast these darts of doubt in your direction and cause you to be discouraged at your own imperfection. Christ has left us with an assurance of his love. Mm -hmm. And that is the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Are you able to comprehend and say amen to the scriptures? Amen. Do you find sin repulsive and especially our own sin? Do we find that we're strangers and pilgrims in the world? Can we see the Holy Spirit convicting of sin and righteousness and judgment? Is he revealing the things that God has prepared for them to them that love him? Do you find that the inner man is being strengthened by the Holy Spirit so that the Christ can dwell in your hearts? Is the Holy Spirit teaching you? And is he bringing to your remembrance Christ's words? Can you say that Jesus is Lord? No one can say that without the Holy Spirit. Are you abounding in hope? This isn't an exhaustive list, of course, but all these things are things that the Holy Spirit ministers to us and gives to us. So if you've got that, if you can see that, you have met the conditions for God's love. Yes. Amen. The Holy Spirit is a, is a surety that we have and keep the commandments of Christ. And that is our surety that the Father and the Son have made their abode in us and that God himself loves us. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> For what concord hath Christ with Belial? So what should we be stressing? Should we be hammering on people to obey all the time? Is that the way to achieve the love of God? Someone spoke of this earlier this week. <clears throat> you, can't, you can't achieve the love of God by obeying. That's not the way it works. But you will obey because God loves you and because you love him. Yes. You don't have to be a genius to figure that out. They don't love God because Christ isn't expounded. There's no incentive being given for people to love God in the churches today in general. John tells us that we love him because he first loved us. So we need to tell people about what God has done in Jesus Christ. Yes. How many people do you know that you would say this to without any fears or any reservations? How many people do you know that you would say, I will do anything you ask me to do? Maybe, maybe even some of us can't even say that to our spouses without some kind of fear. <laughs> but you know, you, you can say that to Jesus. Amen. You, in the matters of obedience, you can say, you can, you can submit yourself to him without any fear. You can say, I'll do whatever you want me to do, Lord. We can do that without fear with Jesus because he loves us. We wouldn't dare say that to just anyone. Because we can say that because we are in agreement with his commands, because our hearts have been made tender and willing for him. The truth is accepted and believed, even if we don't fully understand it at times. His chastening is humbly received. The brethren of Christ are loved. Commandments are obeyed without argument. And we find that indeed his yoke is easy and his burden light. Amen. Whatever he asks us to do will be possible, will be beneficial for us, and he will give us the grace to do it. Amen. In the finer, final tender moments here that Jesus shared with his disciples, the uh, last several chapters of John there, I just love that section. He really boiled down his mission for his disciples. He talked with a lot of clarity there to them, at least it's clear to us now anyway. He tells them in John chapter 14, verse 30 and 31, Hereafter I will not talk much with you, for the prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me. 
but that the world may know that I love the Father, and as he gave me commandment, even so I do. Arise, let us go hence. Uh, Jesus declared his love for his disciples more than once, and we certainly do not question his love for us, which was and is so profoundly demonstrated. But here Jesus speaks of this grander purpose on a grander scale of, his, of the covenant between the Father and the Son. He speaks of a different demonstration of divine love, of a love, a mutual love between divine persons. How is he going to demonstrate his love for the Father? I'm going to do what he gave me to do. Now, if you've been made partakers of divine nature, you're going to have the same response. Amen. You'll participate in that same love, and as Jesus did, you will do what he asks, <clears throat> and his Father will certainly love us. I just want to read my main text here again in closing. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him, and will manifest myself to him. If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. For the Father himself loveth you, because you have loved me, and have believed that I came out from God. Amen.